Now we have two more. We have the secant and the cosecant functions. They're not difficult to understand. We are gonna do a computer demo to show you what those graphs look like, so stick with me. But before we jump into the computer demo, I want you to, to remind you of something, and that is what, what I call the trig rainbow. So if you write down sine, followed by cosine, followed by tangent, followed by cotangent, followed by secant, and cosecant. These are the ways, whoops, CSC is cosecant. Uh, this is the order in, in which I want you to remember this stuff. Then if you uh, draw a little triangle or a little uh, rainbow right here, this is a good way to remember these identities, right? So uh, if you look at the secant and the cosecant function, what this rainbow is telling you that the secant of some angle X, see it's connected to the cosine, is one over cosine of x. So this is a good way to remember which ones go together. Secant is 1 over cosine and cosecant, which is what we're going to study today, of some angle is 1 over the sine of some angle. So I want you to have that in the back of your mind because in order to graph the secant or the cosecant function, all we're going to do is look at the sine or the cosine function, perform the division 1 over uh, either of those functions, and we'll arrive at the secant or the cosecant. So let's go jump into the computer and see how it works right now. Hello, welcome back. The first uh, graph we're going to take a look at is the secant of an angle, but in order to do that, we know the secant is 1 divided by the cosine. So I'm going to remind you what a cosine looks like. It starts at the number 1 up here in the axis, and dips down to negative 1, and it returns back to positive 1 over an interval of 2 pi. So the period of a cosine function is 2 pi, and I have a note to remind you of that down below. Now, in order to figure out what the secant is, what we have to do is take 1, the number 1, and divide it by the cosine, which is, you know, every point on this curve. And what you're going to get is a graph that looks like this. So the secant and the cosecant function are these, uh, they look a little bit like parabolas, but they're squished parabolas. They're, they're a little steeper than that. And you can see that they're repeated. And some of them go up to positive infinity like this, and the other ones go down and stretch out and reach negative infinity. So before we actually talk about how this, uh, you know, how this comes about, like exactly what the shape is, for now just accept that this is the graph of the secant function. What is the period of this function? Well, if you look uh, here, you can see that it goes uh, up to infinity, and then it goes negative infinity, and then back down to negative infinity, and then the thing starts over again at positive infinity. So what we really want to do is figure out what is the interval where we get one of these uh, uppercase u's and one of these upside down u's together would form one entire cycle, okay? So if you look at the origin here uh, and look from the origin over to 2 pi, we have one of these guys upside down and on the other side we actually have a complete u on the upside too because we have half of one here and then we have the other one right here. You can mentally stitch those together and they would form another cycle. And so the uh, period of the secant function you can see going from here and then back here it's going to start again. Once it gets down here to the bottom of this upper u then it would start over again here. So the cycle is 2 pi. So the secant function and also later in a minute the cosecant function have a 2 pi period which is the same as the sine and the cosine. So it's easy to remember. Um, only the tangent function is a little weird and the cotangent because the period is, is half of that. It's pi. But for secant and cosecant the period is 2 pi. Now why do, uh, why does it have this shape? So let's go take a look at a couple of points here. If we go up above to the cosine function, the point here when uh, the angle is equal to zero, the cosine of zero is one. So you take the one divided by one, and what do you get here? One divided by one is one. So you can see down here on the graph, you have one, two, three, four, five tick marks. The secant function passes through the number one. That's as low as it goes. The reason is because it's one divided by the cosine. One divided by one is one. Now, as you move to the right, you're dividing by a smaller and smaller and smaller number because the cosine is getting smaller. Eventually, the cosine is going to get very, very, very small, but it's going to still remain positive. And so it's going to get very, very small. So one divided by that really small number is going to drive it to positive infinity right here, you see? And that's why it goes to positive infinity. But then once you jump over this spot where it crosses at pi over 2 here, then the number, the cosine is very, very small, but then it becomes negative. So we are dividing by a very, 1 divided by a very small negative number is going to not give you positive infinity, it's going to give you negative infinity, and that's why right when we pass through pi over 2, it jumps down discontinuously to negative infinity. And then the thing kind of goes up, uh, starts getting uh, bigger, 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 all the way up to a maximum here of negative 1, and the reason for that is because 
When we have cosine of pi, the answer to that is negative 1. And 1 divided by negative 1 is going to give you negative 1. So it gets to a maximum of here. So that's what's going on. The secant function basically stretches down to the number 1 from positive infinity. And it stretches up to the number negative 1 from negative infinity. And it forms these u's and then these upside down u's. And the period is 2 pi. Uh, so if you want to look at it over 0 to 2 pi, you can have half of 1 here. The other half goes with it. That's one upper u, and then here's a lower u. Together they form one cycle, so the period is 2 pi. All right, so that's the secant function. Let's take a look at these graphs together. Sometimes some students uh, can visualize it better if we see it on one graph. So uh, what I've done in this graph is I've graphed the blue the cosine function in blue and then the secant function in gold. And so you can just mentally take any point on this cosine curve and take the number one and divide it by that. And then you're going to get what's on the gold curve. So over here, one divided by one is one. So the secant is one. Over here at pi over 2, 1 divided by 0 is infinity. And of course, on the left-hand side, it goes to positive infinity. On the right-hand side of pi over 2, it goes to negative infinity. And as you march between, as you see the cosine decreasing in this region right here, then you're dividing by a smaller and smaller number, so the secant is driven slowly up towards infinity like this. And the cycle just repeats, but on the negative side, this negative cosine has negative numbers, but the, exactly the same thing is happening down here. All right, so the... Uh, whereas the tangent and the cotangent has these funny s curves, the secant and the cosecant has these funny u's, up, uh, uppercase u on the top and then a, an upside down u on the bottom below the axis. All right, so now that we have uh, considered what the secant is, uh, the secant being 1 divided by the cosine, let's go and find what the cosecant is, which is defined to be 1 divided by the sine. So we have a similar situation. Here we have a sine curve. A period is 2 pi for the sine. It goes up to a 1 down to a negative 1 and repeats over a 2 pi period. Now 1 divided by, let's just pick a number here, uh, here at pi over 2, uh, the sine is equal to 1, so 1 divided by 1 is, drum roll, 1. And so here at pi over 2, the cosecant is equal to 1. And you see it looks exactly the same. The only real difference between the cosecant and the secant is it shifted with respect to each other. And why is that? Because the sine and the cosine, the only real difference is they are shifted with respect to each other. So again, it starts at positive infinity, dips down to a minimum of 1, and then goes back up. The other one goes up from negative infinity up to a, a negative 1 here, and then goes back down again. So what we're going to do here is uh, continue to... Uh, to understand the secant and the cosecant. I think the best way to do that is, again, to put these on the same curve uh, here. So I can show you what that's like. So what we have here is a sign that is drawn. OK, and you can see the cosecant is the same thing. It goes down and it barely touches the sign. Uh, but why? Because the sine curve is 1. So the sine of pi over 2 is 1. 1 divided by 1 is 1. And so the cosecant is going to go and touch at the maximum and the minimum, just like the secant does. So just to kind of wrap it up, to keep it in your mind, basically the secant is 1 over cosine. And you basically have the, the, the secant come down and touch where the cosine is at its maximum and its minimum, forming these u's and upside down u's. And the cosecant is going to do exactly the same thing. It's just that because the sine curve is shifted, of course, the cosine, uh, the cosecant comes down and is shifted again as uh, rel uh, relative to the same exact thing. All right, so that's the graph of the curves. Let's take a look at what happens when you try to manipulate a secant and a cosecant. But it's all the same story that we've learned for sine and cosine and tangent and cotangent. If you take a secant curve, which is what you have here, and you add a constant to it on the outside, if you add a number to that, it's going to shift the entire curve up because you're just adding the number 4 in this case to whatever the secant gives you. So it shifts the whole thing up. Notice that both the bottom and the top curve both get shifted up by 4. And of course, as you shift it and add 5 or whatever, it lands accordingly. If you subtract a number from it, then it just shifts it down below the axis like that. So it's a vertical shift just like we would expect. What happens if I have a, a number on the outside of the secant and I uh, this is a regular secant and I increase that? Well, what's going to happen is it's like a multiplicative constant. So what's going to happen is it's going to stretch the thing out and it's going to uh, basically stretch it. It also shifts it up a little bit because you're, mul you're multiplying by 5. So the, the secant normally goes down to... You can see the secant normally goes down to 1, but then when you multiply by 5, then it goes down uh, to, a, to a minimum of 5 here. So it does shift it up and down a little bit, but mostly what it's doing is it's stretching it out. You see how usually 
here it's sort of flattened it's kind of a flattened pancake looking shape right here but as you multiply it it literally is like taking it and stretching it in the vertical direction because you're multiplying it in the vertical direction and if you slap a negative coefficient on the outside then the whole thing flips upside down as well all right um what if you change the number on the inside remember this number tells you how many periods you need to have of whatever function it is uh, and so right now it's secant of 1x, so there should be one period in 2 pi, because we know the period is 2 pi. If we change it to secant of 2x, then now there needs to be two complete periods in a 2 pi region. Just doubles the number of, of, of periods, double the frequency, so the period, uh, there should be double the cycles there, so each of the individual periods gets basically half as big. So you can see these u's are half as wide to fit more of them in there. there. But you can see that over 0 to 2 pi we have... Here's uh, one upside down U and one upper. That's one cycle. Here's another upside down U. And then here's half of an upper and here's the other half of an upper. So together that makes another full cycle. So there's two cycles in there. And if you increase it, you're just going to get three full cycles in a two pi region, four full cycles in a two pi region, five full cycles in a two pi region. So that's just increasing the frequency uh, or equivalently uh, cutting the period down of the function. All right, now let's talk about cosecant. All the same song and dance applies. Cosecant is the same thing. It's a shifted secant, shifted to the right here. And if we add a number on the outside, we're just going to uh, shift it. Uh, we're going to push it up, uh, it basically up and down and uh, along the y-axis. Nothing really changes with regards to the shape of the curve, just shifting it up and down. If we put a multiplicative number out on the front, then it basically stretches it out vertically and it also shifts it up a little bit because the cosecant again goes down to a one, minimum of one uh, and negative one. And so if you multiply, then of course you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna shift it a little bit vertically, but mostly what's happening is you are changing the shape of the curve and you're stretching it out because everything is getting stretched in the vertical direction. And then finally, what happens if we change the number on the inside there? The number on the inside is changing the number of periods. It's changing the frequency there. So if we change it to two, then we need to see two cycles of this function in a two pi window. And you can see that's what we have. We have an upper and a lower, that's one cycle. Another upper and a lower, that's another cycle. Remember, uh, in order to form a cycle of this thing, it's, you have to have an upper plus a lower. That forms one cycle. Uh, and so you have two complete cycles like this. This will be three complete cycles like this, and you can go all the way to five if you want. And so uh, what do we have here? We have one pair, two pairs, three pairs, four pairs, five pairs. We have five full cycles in a two pi window. All right. So from the top, basically, uh, we have the secant function, which is just one divided by the cosine, which means that it's going to basically dip down these vertical u's and touch the top of the cosine function. And it's going to do the same thing from negative infinity down below. The period of this thing is going to be 2 pi. And then the cosecant is exactly the same thing, except it's shifted because it's coming down and sort of touching where the sine is. Again, the period is 2 pi. The way the shifting works is the same for both functions. If you add a number on the outside, it shifts it up and down. If you uh, put a number in front of the variable there on the inside or on the outside, sorry, it's just stretching it up and down. And if you put a number on the inside, then it's changing the period, which puts more or fewer of these inside of the normal secant window, the normal secant period. All right, let's jump out of the computer here and go back to the board and wrap up the lesson. All right, welcome back to the lecture portion. Hope you enjoyed the computer demo. I find that looking at pictures helps tremendously when visualizing things. We mostly covered what I want to cover in this lesson, just to understand the shapes of these graphs. Uh, and what I want to do here is just kind of go over it to make sure you understand uh, there. And we'll, we'll draw a little sketch to make sure we understand in a second as well, just to kind of get practice with sketching it. So basically, I'm graphing the cosine and the secant function together just over one period. Remember, the period of this thing is 2 pi. And so the blue curve is the cosine, and the secant is 1 over that. So 1 over 1 is 1, and over here, when I get to cosine of, of the angle here at 0, then 1 over 0 is infinity. And of course, it jumps from positive to negative infinity because here is a, a very small positive number. Here is this very small negative number. So 1 divided by that gives me plus or minus infinity. And I have the same repeating pattern. But the mostly what I want you to know is that the period here of the secant function is 2 pi. Here, I've drawn the exact same curve. I've got the cosine function there, and I've got the secant function just drawn over 4 pi. So I've opened up the window for you to see that the period here, you have one full cycle here, 
You have another half, uh, well, I, this is not a full cycle, sorry. You have one full upside down U, an upper U, here's half, and here's the other half. So if you cut it right here, this would be a cycle. Because to get a cycle, you need to have a lower U and an upper U, because then it would repeat again. Look here, if you start here, this is the function, and then uh, right here is where it would start to repeat again, tracing out what you started with. So right here, the period is 2 pi, all right? And then I have exactly the same thing drawn over here for the cosecant function. I have instead the sine drawn because that's what's related to the cosecant. And one over this, 1 over 1 is 1, 1 over 0 is infinity, 1 over 0 here is infinity. We have the jump, same as usual. And the period again is 2 pi. We have an upper u and a lower u, and then it would repeat again. So we have a period of 2 pi. Here I have drawn exactly the same thing. Uh, here over a larger window of 4 pi. So you can see that here is one period. Here is where it would start over. So we have 2 pi for the period. Now just to close it out, we're going to spend just a second sketching one of these by hand because that's what you're going to be expected to do on your test. We're not going to do any, any fancy problems right, that, right now. We're just going to graph the, um, the secant and the cosecant really quickly. So how would we do it? This is how you would do it, right? So here's x. And what, what I'm actually going to graph is two functions. I'm going to graph just like we're going to reproduce the graphs that we did over here, right? We, let's do it over one period. So here's 2 pi. Here's pi. Here's pi divided by 2. Here's 3 pi divided by 2. Uh, and the sine and the cosine function goes up from 1 uh, and negative 1 here. And if we're drawing the uh, secant, we need to know what the cosine is. So let's draw the cosine. So the cosine is going to go down uh, here and then go up through here and here. So it's going to go something like this. Is this going to be perfect? No, but it's going to be all right. We're going to go down here. We're going to go up here. And then something like this. This is one cycle of a cosine. So then switch colors. And in order to draw the secant function, what you do is you go down and you say, all right, right here where the cosine or where the cosine goes to zero is where my asymptotes are going to be. So let me go ahead and draw my little asymptotes because I know that I'm going to get infinities there. Those are like barriers. I can't really go through them. And then what I'll do is I'll draw it like this. So what, I'm going to have a U that's going to come down from below, touch this guy, and go down below like this. And then it's going to kind of like kiss this right here and then go up like this. And it's going to kiss this guy right here and go in like this. So basically this is secant of X. And the red line is cosine of X. All right? Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. Did I get the stretching exactly right? No. Did I make it perfect shape? No. But that's okay. When you're sketching, you just want to have a general idea of, of where it is. And, and you know why it starts here and here and why it shifted the way it is. It's because it's coming down and touching the cosine function. So we're going to do the same thing over here. We're going to graph the cosecant. And for that, we're going to need to also draw the sine function. So x. And here's f of x. Let's go ahead and draw our uh, 2 pi. Here's pi, here's pi divided by 2, here's 3 pi divided by 2. Here's 1, and here is negative 1. So in order to draw the cosecant, we need to figure out what the sine is. The sine we know starts at 0 maximum. It goes down here, it goes through here, and then back up there. So it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to go something like this. It's going to go down, up through there, like this. That's one cycle of a sine curve. Then you look and say, well, where are my asymptotes going to be? Right? Well, it's going to be wherever the sine is zero. The sine of zero is right there. That's going to drive the cosecant to infinity because one over, one over zero is infinity. And so then what's going to happen is I'm going to have this guy come down and touch right down here and go back up. And this guy's never going to touch that asymptote there either. And it's going to go right there. And of course, if you wanted to, you could draw another little asymptote right there. And so the black curve, together, they form what we call the cosecant of x. And the red curve is what we call, of course, the sine of x. All right, and you could check yourself, you know, let's do it. So here we have the cosecant that goes up and, and down starting at the, x, uh, the uh, y axis right there. Cosecant more or less looks like that, starts at the axis, goes up, basically touches this guy. And to refresh your memory, what the secant looks like, it does exactly the same thing, it just touches where the cosine is, touches where the cosine is. And so we'll go back and just verify that. It touches where the cosine is for the secant of x. 
So I didn't have to draw those, right? I like to draw them though, because a lot of times uh, in your exams or whatever, you'll need to sketch them. But instead of trying to memorize what they look like, like if you can memorize where they are, then excellent, that's awesome. I actually have a problem remembering, okay, does the cosecant start here or is that the one that shifted over here? Like if you can remember that, then awesome, but I just can't. So usually what I do is I sketch the cosine and the sine function to remember then where the secant and the cosecant lies. And I know they have the same period, they have a two pi period. Because I've been repeating that, I'm trying to teach you that and get that into your head as well. So what I'd like you to do is watch this lesson again, Make sure you understand the general shape of the secant and the cosecant function and follow me on to the next lesson. We'll draw a few sketches where we shift around or otherwise manipulate the secant and the cosecant functions. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.